This is the KOB4 Santa Fe, New Mexican 3rd Congressional District Debate. The candidates working to earn your vote are Democrat Teresa Ledger Fernandez and Republican Alexis Martinez Johnson. Moderating tonight, KOB's Tessa Mentis and Chris Ramirez. And from the Santa Fe, New Mexican, Michael Gerstein. So for all of you watching on TV, online, or listening in from around our state through our network of radio partners, welcome. And we welcome Michael Gerstein to the moderating panel. Michael is a political reporter with the Santa Fe New Mexican. And we of course welcome Democrat Teresa Ledger Fernandez and Republican Alexis Martinez Johnson. Both of these candidates are appearing from their homes in Santa Fe this evening. We do have a KOB4 staff member with each of them to help with timekeeping and to ensure that everybody is following our rules. And KOB photojournalists are with each candidate as well to provide the live technology that we are using to broadcast all of this to your homes tonight. Let's talk about those rules. These are the rules KOB established and the candidates have agreed to all of them. Candidates will have one minute for opening remarks, two minutes to answer each question, 90 seconds for closing remarks, and moderators may interrupt a candidate who exceed the time limits. Rebuttals are at the moderator's discretion. We will take two very short commercial breaks, and we also expect both candidates to respect their opponent's time and not interject when it is not their turn to talk. Earlier this week, candidates flipped a coin to decide the order of appearance for both opening and closing statements. And Alexis Martinez Johnson, you are going to go first this evening. Teresa Ledger Fernandez will be going second. So with that, Ms. Martinez Johnson, you may begin with your opening statements. Thank you for having me and good evening. My name is Alexis Martinez Johnson and I'm running for US Congress. I'm a mother, a wife, an environmental engineer. I've spent my career making sure our water was clean, our air was clean, and our soil was clean. I made sure energy flowed and New Mexican jobs were there for the community. After 30 years of failed leadership, it's time for a change, New Mexico. My priorities are infrastructure structure, meaning to have broadband access for telehealth and the education of our children. I want to have jobs in New Mexico with an inclusive economy. I also promote education opportunities. I look forward to earning your vote. Thank you so much. Please vote Alexis M. Johnson. Muchisimas gracias. Okay, thank you. Now, Teresa Ledger Fernandez, you may now begin your opening statements. I'm Teresa Ledger Fernandez. I grew up in Las Vegas, New Mexico, where I went to Head Start and fell in love with learning. You know I'm going to champion early childhood education. I have dedicated my life as a public servant working on the issues that we face today, working alongside Native American tribes, small businesses, nonprofits on health care, education, affordable housing protecting our environment, voting rights, and so much more. Experience matters, especially in this crisis when we must put public health above politics. I'm also a cancer survivor. I lost two brothers to addiction. I'm the mother of three wonderful sons. I have lived experience like many of us. I am wanting to protect what we love. I promise you, if elected, I will do all I can to protect what we love and invest in our future. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, thank you. We want to go ahead and jump into these questions. So let's get started. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, parts of northern New Mexico were and continue to battle another public health crisis, and that is addiction. Elected officials before you have not solved this generational problem. What assistance and intervention on the federal level would you use to help northern New Mexicans kick their drug addictions? Teresa Ledger Fernandez, we begin with you tonight. This is an incredibly important issue, the issue of addiction and the ravages that our communities have faced really for generations. Uh, as I said in my opening, this is something that I know deeply, I know personally. Uh, we lost two beautiful brothers, Howard and Rando, to addiction and substance abuse. Uh, the failings of uh, the ability to have their um, mental health condition diagnosed. The problem was 
we could not get treatment for them. There were simply not enough beds. We were treating addiction and substance abuse not as a public health crisis that we now know it is, but we were treating it as something to solely and purely criminalize. We now know it's a public health crisis. So one of the things that I would do is support the Comprehensive Addiction Resource Emergency Act. The CARE Act, before there was CARES for COVID, the CARE Act would put $10 billion a year into addiction. It would focus on providing um, treatment centers, providing assistance to the communities that are impacted with high addiction rates, because we know that our governments need to respond to this. So providing the resources so that we could train those who would need to be able to respond to this. So once again, we are going to be putting resources into treatment, treating it as a public health issue. We need beds. We need treatment facilities, we need outpatient treatment, but then also investing in the community so that the communities can respond, so that our ambulance workers, our first responders, understand what they're dealing with when they're being called, perhaps, on a call to where there might be an overdose. So there is a role for the federal government to play. There is a bill that I will be a co-sponsor of if I am elected to Congress. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, thank you. And now to Ms. Martinez Johnson. Thank you very much. In this District 3, we have two counties that have the highest rate of substance abuse. For 12 years with Ben Ray Lujan, we have not seen any change. We have lost a generation where now grandparents and grandchildren, the grandchildren have the water rights because an entire generation is lost. Coming from humble beginnings and being raised by extended family members, I know very well the struggle in New Mexico to have opportunity. And I think it's time to open the doors of opportunity here in New Mexico to educate our children. I promote education is key. That has been the priority in my life. And even though my grandparents didn't have uh, a formal education or even almost a high school education, they taught me through education and hard work, perseverance and New Mexican pride, we can achieve. In US Congress, I would look to have a substance abuse funding for areas in the North. We have been forgotten for too long. It is imperative not only to have centers to rehabilitate the chemical dependency that has taken so many lives and has been a tragedy in regard to the amount of crime that is committed along the interstate corridor. But that is not the only approach. Not only do we need treatment centers, but we need to educate our children. We need to have economic and an inclusive environment for people that graduate from high school, middle management and upper management, so that they have opportunity and jobs. Ambition is gone when there is no opportunity here in New Mexico. I also support scanning at the U.S.-Mexican border to prevent illicit drug use. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martinez-Johnson. Okay, our next question will be asked by Santa Fe, New Mexican political reporter Michael Kirstein. Michael. Thanks, Chris. Uh, more than half the state's residents are enrolled in government-provided health insurance through Medicare or Medicaid, uh, and many others have uh, private insurance and, and struggle with high deductible payments, co-pays, and medical debt. Has this country done enough to provide affordable health insurance, and what measures would you push for in Congress to help extend affordable health, health coverage to more people? We're going to begin with Alexis Martinez Johnson for that one. Thank you very much. Healthcare is very important here in New Mexico. As we've been told in the past that we would be able to have our own doctors from before, that has not been the case. When we were told that we would have affordable health care for the middle class, that has not happened. I seek to make sure that we take care of our Medicare and our elders that are on Medicare and to protect our Medicaid for children that came from humble beginnings like myself so that they could have immunizations and a great start in life. But in 
Contrast to my opponent who supports Medicare for all, I promote choice. When I take my little girl to doctor, I want to make sure that she's getting the best quality care and that I work with that doctor and I have a choice. I want to make sure that I can afford the co-payment when I go in and that there's no hidden bills. I would work in Congress to make sure that services are transparent. There are no goods or services that we buy that we don't know the price beforehand. I look to continue to reduce the prescription drug health care costs where we've had insulin go down from 140 down to 40. My grandparents were on insulin and can you imagine with a household of four on $12,000 a year my grandparents would never be able to afford insulin. I look to further competition between the states in regard to insurance to bring those premiums down for the middle class. We shouldn't be paying an entire salary for health care. So I do not promote Medicare for all that my opponent promotes. You will see what we see at the motor vehicle department where people are waiting in line with no choice. And if you have an issue that needs to take, be taken care of, you're going to have to wait six or more months. Okay, Ms. Alexis Martinez Johnson, thank you. Teresa Ledger Fernandez, you may now answer this question. So, uh, the question was about how we, and what should we be doing? Um, I have worked on issues around healthcare in New Mexico. Uh, I helped build three world health clinics. One of those health clinics is exactly what I wish we had across the country. It's over here on I-25 uh, and between the two cities. When you walk into that health clinic, you let them know whether you have Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, IHS, but then your needs are taken care of. And they're taken care of in your community where the where we're dealing with issues so that they're culturally sensitive. I believe that we must ensure that we have rural health clinics, that those rural health clinics need to be close by uh, so that when we have access, we are talking about it needs to be in your community. I do believe that there is a big difference in terms of what we are suggesting uh, here, you know, the Democrats, uh, myself. Uh, we are talking about making sure that health care is available to all. Uh, we are talking about maintaining the Affordable Care Act while the Republicans um, are trying to get rid of it. Right now, the Affordable Care Act has allowed millions of people, including in New Mexico, to have access to health care. It has prevented people like me who have a pre-existing condition from not getting health care. So we need to maintain that and not get rid of it as the Republicans are trying to do. Um, I do think that we need to move away from an employment-based health system because, as we know, we lost way too many jobs and those people lost their health insurance as well. So what I support is what we're doing now, what Biden is proposing now, that we strengthen the Affordable Care Act, uh, but we also have a public option so we can move towards move towards a single payer system where we're focusing not on what the insurance is, but who your doctor is and are you getting the care you need? Okay, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, thank you very much. It's actually time for our first break, so we'll be back in just one minute. And welcome back to the third congressional district debate with Democrat Teresa Ledger Fernandez and Republican Alexis Martinez Johnson. Chris has our next question tonight. Yeah, yeah Tessa, thank you. You know, the COVID-19 crisis exposed the stark reality that gaps in healthcare and infrastructure are major problems in Indian country. For example, on the Navajo Nation, thousands continue to live without running water or electricity. So the question is, do you believe the federal government should help Native American tribes more? And if so, specifically, what does help look like? We begin with Teresa Ledger Fernandez. Thank you. This is indeed a very important question because we know our Native American communities have been ravaged by COVID. Um, yes, the question is, should they do more? And the answer is yes. The United States owes a trust responsibility to our Native American tribes. They signed treaties with our tribes and they made agreements that they would provide uh, in exchange for the lands that we now utilize, that they would provide health care, education, uh, infrastructure, and they have failed to do that. Uh, Congress appropriated $8 billion out of come uh, with the COVID relief. This administration failed to get most of that money out quickly. Um, the, the tribes had to sue. 
Um, and so, yes, we need to have more of that uh, happening. What it would look like is full funding for the Indian Health Service. The Indian Health Service is funded at about 40% of what its need is. If we had full funding for the Indian Health Service, some of these issues would not have gotten as bad as they are. We need to allow the tribes to take over and run themselves the health clinics, like the health clinic I mentioned earlier, which is on Santo Domingo. They run that themselves, and they do a great job about it. So we need to allow that to happen. There needs to be full funding for infrastructure. Um, there is not enough. I've, sp I've put down about $100 million worth of infrastructure and clean water. That's not enough. It costs a lot of money to put in broadband and clean water. I have suggested that we make sure we have renewable energy, solar energy on those places where it's hard to reach, where the electric lines are going to cost too much to take. I suggested that we have solar energy on uh, the Navajo Nation in our last debate. My opponent called that a radical and extremist idea, but it's important. It's a great idea. There is lots of sun in our Native American communities where we can utilize renewable energy to bring some of these important uh, resources like clean, uh, like uh, infrastructure, clean water to uh, the homes where they need to get to. Okay, thank you. Alexis Martinez Johnson, you can now answer this question. Thank you very much. And I wanted to talk about, you know, the health care and infrastructure and Navajo Nation is imperative. Why, after 12 years and more, why don't we have water or electricity in Navajo Nation? Ben Ray Lujan hasn't delivered. He endorsed my opponent, and it's going to be the status quo. You heard her throwing around figures of money, $100 million. I don't throw around money. I do. I don't sue. I do. I don't just talk. I do. When my opponent said that I said solar panel, panels were radical, what I'm getting to is this. I'm an environmental engineer. My approach is a balanced, sensible approach to provide needed and economic infrastructure in the community. She promotes the Green New Deal, which are if you're going to fuel New Mexico by only solar panels and only wind turbines. That is an extreme policy. We need to work in conjunction with our scientists and engineers to provide the much needed water and electricity, which would help in this pandemic and could have saved lives. Only now are we seeing broadband access in Navajo Nation when Ben Ray Lujan receives a contribution from Comcast. It's time to change New Mexico, and I'm here to pull the curtain back so you can understand that the politics and status quo here in New Mexico needs to change. Coming from political families and political wealth, your voice is not listened to. I am here in Navajo Nation and in the rest of the community to bring results. One of my first legislative pieces would to me to make sure that we had a rapid response. The medical teams that we had out on Navajo Nation with this administration, the ventilators and PPE, we need to work with our community on the federal, state, and local levels. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, if you would like a rebuttal opportunity, we're going to give this to you. Okay, thank you. So, um, I want to point out that my opponent owes an uh, oil and gas company in Midland, Texas. And uh, she denied that in the last debate, but she actually does. She stated it in her FEC filings. Uh, before this, she was not calling herself an environmental engineer. She was calling herself an oil and gas engineer. That's what she says in her Facebook postings and here. So she has an interest in not moving towards renewable energy, but in staying with fossil fuels. So I do believe that having renewable energy doing the Energy Transition Act is very important for New Mexico. It's, important, it's as important at Navajo as it is for Las Vegas or Clovis. And Ms. Martinez Johnson, we're gonna give you an opportunity for a rebuttal and then we're gonna move on to the next question. I'm an environmental engineer and that's what it says on my degree. I worked for Larson and Associates it takes a quick search on Google to find that out. It also takes a quick search on Google to find out my family 
is a part of a small business, the backbone of New Mexico. Uh, the backbone is there in Texas and New Mexico in the Permian Basin in our energy sector. We promote water recycling, we promote geothermal, and we are an engineering firm. So I would appreciate, if you're going to speak about my family, at least get your facts straight. I have dedicated my life to make sure that our air, water, and soil is clean. And I do not appreciate anyone saying incorrect information about me or my family. I am very proud to be a part of the energy industry, and that okay. includes yep. the oil and Thank gas you. industry. Thank you. You're 45 seconds. Ms. Martinez Johnson. Ms. Martinez Johnson, gowns. your 45 seconds for your rebuttal is up. Thank you. We're going to go to Tessa now. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, Michael Gerstein with the Santa Fe New Mexican actually has the next question. Michael. Thanks, Tessa. Scientists predict that more widespread and intense wildfires and more extreme and prolonged droughts will happen with greater frequency as the planet continues to warm. The issue is of particular importance in arid New Mexico where rivers and aquifers grow less plentiful every year. How specifically should Congress combat climate change and ensure that New Mexico residents have access to clean water in the future? Alexis Martinez Johnson, you are the first with this question. Thank you very much, and I'm really excited to answer this question. The extreme policies that my opponent advocates for, where we can't even cut the trees down in Las Vegas, in the federal forests, creates a fire hazard. So as these extreme groups thought that they were helping the spotted owl, in fact, they put New Mexicans out in the cold, quite literally, where we could not even chop our wood. They put New Mexicans out of jobs. The lumber mills are closed. What happens when you have a monoculture of trees stacked one by one by one, and we can't cut down the trees for our cattle to graze? When a lightning strike hits, that mountain will go up in flames. The native community understands very well how to manage forests. We need to take a proactive approach. And as an environmental engineer, we don't wait for a catastrophe to occur. We manage our lands. There's no doubt that our environment is heating up. And I'm not here to deny any of that. What I am here to say is that extreme policy, extreme party politics is not what my what we need here in New Mexico. We need to come together from all parties and work for the betterment so that we can have access to those water sources. We don't need to be told in our acequias how to manage our water. We need to have funding on the federal level for the areas in Española and Taos to make sure that their acequias provide the traditional uses for the land. My opponent advocates for more and more government control. How much have we surrendered already, New Mexicans? And how much are we going to surrender in the future? I offer a compromise and a moderate approach. As an environmental engineer, I have a very unique skill set to move New Mexico forward. Thank you very much. And now, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, it's your turn for this uh, question. Thank you very much. So the question was about climate change and what we needed to do. It recognized the fact that in New Mexico, we are an arid state and we are a fragile state. That if we do not take st strong and bold action to address climate change and to transition away from fossil fuels, we New Mexicans will be at the forefront and the pain we will feel will be drastic. The economic pain and the pain of losing this beautiful place we call home. But I, I'm actually an Asequia commissioner. I am, I'm an Asequia paciente. So I know these issues really well. And what happens is if we don't take care of it, that Rio and Medio fire that we had, that's the Asequia that I was a commissioner. That Asequia is ruined because of that. And we normally don't have fires in August, do we? We know that. So we know we need to take strong and bold action. And that includes transitioning away, having a, a uh, having more renewable energy, joining, rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, uh, and really what the Green New Deal is, 
What we should know, I actually did uh, an op-ed in the New Mexican about what the Green New Deal is. And what that says is, while we are attacking our climate crisis, let's also make sure that we invest in those communities that have helped power us, which means that we're going to invest in Farmington. The same way we're investing in Farmington with the Energy Transition Act, as we try to get to full renewable energy in New Mexico, it means we're going to try to create jobs, new jobs. The new jobs is about 30,000 and new jobs from renewable solar and wind energy. It means we're going to invest in those communities that have been hardest hit by the after effects from pollution. Uh, we know that in New Mexico, uh, fossil fuel has been problematic. We had 1,400 oil and gas and contaminated spills last year alone. And that was a good year. So we know we must protect our environment. We must move forward. We must transition. Thank you, Ms. Alger Fernandez. Thank you. Okay, we are going to take a short break. The candidates will make their closing statements when we return in one minute. The question and answer portion of this debate is now over. So now we move into closing statements. And according to that coin flip, Alexis Martinez Johnson, you are up first. Muchisimas gracias, New Mexico. Thank you so much for electing me and making history in New Mexico. As you know, I have become the first Republican that has been elected, not from party insiders, but from the people of New Mexico. You see a clear difference between my opponent and I, and that is I am not here to tell you what to do. I will always come to my constituents like I have, and we will work together to make sure that you can put food on the table, a roof over your head, educate your children, and do it in a safe environment. The Green New Deal that my opponent advocates for, Biden doesn't even support it. This is no longer the party of my abuelos, the one with JFK saying, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I believe in the individual, and I believe what my abuela always told me, mija, si se puede. I want that for my children, and I am tired of the extreme measures and the gentrification of ideas here in New Mexico. It's time to reclaim a position at our own dinner table. I bring a unique skill set as an environmental engineer to come together irrespective of party. It's about time we work together. It's time for change. Vote Alexis M. Johnson. Gracias. Okay, Teresa Ledger Fernandez, you may now begin your closing remarks. Protecting what we love our families, our health care, our democracy has never been more important than during this COVID crisis when President Trump has failed us. His failures have led to deaths among our Native American communities and those most at risk. Our economy is a mess. My opponent has stated that she stands with Donald Trump 100% on his COVID response. In contrast, I believe that we need leadership that is about caring for our communities, that puts public health above science, that is based on understanding our district because you've worked in it and walked in it. My opponent has an oil and gas company in Midland, Texas. She registered to vote there in 2011, did not register to vote in New Mexico until 2019, when she moved, bought a home here, and soon started running for Congress. I think that experience matters. And my experience has been working in the community on the issues I have described during this debate. Two presidents trusted me enough to appoint me to work on affordable housing and cultural preservations for our country. I'm asking you to vote for Teresa Ledger Fernandez if you want somebody who has direct experience addressing health care, protecting our environment, and creating jobs. Muchísimas gracias por tu voto y tu presencia esta noche. Thank you, Vanessa Ledger Fernandez and Alexis Martinez Johnson for giving voters in New Mexico's 3rd Congressional District more information about yourselves and about your views. And a big thank you to our co-moderator, Michael Gerstein from the Santa Fe New Mexican. And thank you all at home. We'll have highlights of the debate and analysis tonight on the Night Beat. So have a great night and please vote. We're going to join NBC programming already in progress.